So, real analysis. Why real analysis? Why not real analysis? Well, okay, so what are we doing here? We're going we're gonna to talk about the big measure and measure theory in general and do all this complicated stuff. Why? Yes? To prove theorems. To prove theorems, yes. But why did people, I mean, people don't prove theorems for the sake of proving theorems. They prove theorems because they're, they're important and they, yeah? Well, like, um, What's your name? I'm going to try to learn. Uh, Justin. Justin. So you can build a, a framework and then it can solve problems which the old framework couldn't do. So That's true. Um, in hindsight, developing the big measure and measure theory was really important because measure theory solved Colin Regard's problem on uh, foundations for probability theory, uh, Hilbert's problem, which was solved by Colin Regard. Um, there, uh, yes, measure theory became extremely useful after it was developed. But why was it developed in the first place? So you open up any real analysis textbook, except for Stein Shikarchi, which is why I like Stein Shikarchi so much. You open up any book and they say, um, look at this function. f of x is 0 on the rationals and 1 on the irrationals. And if you try to do a Riemann integral, so the integral from 0 to 1, f of x dx, you remember what a Riemann integral is. So what's a Riemann integral? Yeah. yeah, you break up, you have this function, you have whatever the function is, let's say from 0 to 1, you're going to break it up into little rectangles, maybe a partition. So it's, um, well, there's a Riemann upper sum and a Riemann lower sum. So at every point, we're going to look at the, the largest value it takes in a region and the smallest value it takes in a region. And then uh, if the difference between those two goes to 0 as the, as the mesh gets finer and finer, that's the Riemann integral. But of course, for this particular function, um, it's going to be 0 on all the rationals and 1 on all the irrationals, and those are dense, and so there's no Riemann integral. And that's what the textbooks say. And I find this completely disingenuous, because who the hell cares about integrating this stupid function? <laughs> um, the textbooks say this for a very good reason. It's what Lebeig himself says. So Lebeig, so this is 1902, Lebeig, this is his PhD thesis. It's a little too late to have PhD theses. Uh, well, you never know. There are, there are still people putting out PhD theses that have this much impact um, immediately. This, this had immediate impact to solving lots and lots of problems, as we'll discuss right now. You guys can see this OK? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Lebesgue's thesis, he begins by saying, there are functions, well, Warstrauss in particular constructed functions that are continuous but nowhere differentiable, which was like, you know, really, they're weird functions, and you would want to integrate these weird functions. So here's how you do it with Lebesgue measure, with Lebesgue integration. I mean, he didn't, we call it Lebesgue, he called it, here's, here's a theory of integration. Um, so it was already in the air by 1902 that these were important problems to solve. And I was thinking about why don't they tell the truth? Well, maybe, I don't know. This is my version of the truth, I'm not a historian. But here's what I think really happened. Um, I think the story of why people started to care about functions like this goes back to the 18, well, 1807, 1811, let's call it 1820s, just to be kind of on the safe side. So it begins with Fourier. Fourier ruined it all. I mean, it really begins with Newton. So we're talking 1660s, 1680s. Newton starts doing calculus. Leibniz also later, but... Uh, Leibniz actually tells people what he's doing, and so we call it calculus and not fluxions. Um, Newton's theory of fluxions is, uh, has no rigorous foundation. Right? There's no, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's an area, you, you get the sense of what you're supposed to do. They didn't think, I mean, this is called the Riemann integral. Riemann's 200 years af after Newton. So there was a while where people just kind of intuited what a limit was. They intuited what an integral was. It's an area, it's a signed area, we get it. It's above the x-axis, below the x-axis is negative. Um, you didn't need anything more complicated than that. They could solve differential equations. The entire lifespan of Euler and his thousands of publications did not need rigorous analysis, if you think about how much he accomplished. okay. So um, all was fine and dandy until Fourier comes along and he solves the heat equation. So, so the solution to the heat equation. And I want to show you People say it's Fourier series. Fourier didn't want Fourier series. He didn't want anything. He just wanted to solve a differential equation, an extremely natural dif differential equation. And when you solve this very natural differential equation, in what today is completely elementary, of course, then it was groundbreaking work, you are forced 
into issues of this nature. You have no other choice but to study uh, sequences of functions and interchanging orders and integration and when does the sequence converge to the integral and all this kind of nonsense. All right, so that's what I want to discuss to set the stage for what we're going to be doing all semester and why we're doing this and why people had to do this. Okay, so um, what's the heat equation? Let's say we're in one dimension. We have a line. We have a pipe. Okay, we're in, uh, in outer space, so the pipe has zero so let's say um, u of x and t is the heat or temperature at x at position x, let's say from 0 to 1, just to make life simple, uh, at time t. OK, so t starts at 0, x ranges from 0 to 1. All right, so, um, so the heat at, uh, at the endpoints at 0 t and at 1 t, you're in outer space, 0 Kelvin. Okay, so the heat will be dissipated. What's happening in the, in the pipe itself? So we have a one-dimensional, we're trying to make this uh, as simple as possible. Um, uh, at time 0, at time 0, we have some function. We have some initial condition of whatever the heat distribution was. We know nothing about it. Um, what is the heat equation? So what's going on to molecules nearby? Well, think about how heat works. If I'm kind of cold, um, Justin? You move to warm. Right. If, I'm, if, if my neighbors are warmer than I am, then my, my molecules are like not jiggling as fast as theirs, and they're going to bounce, and they're going to give me more of their energy, and I'm going to take more of their energy. So the change, this is measured by the Laplacian. Let me not, in the interest of time, spend, it is not 135. <laughs> Piece of crap. Okay, at least the minute hand is close. That's all I need. Um, it's not working at all. <laughs> <laughs> a wrong clock is right twice a day. Okay, it's not working at all. Thank you. So I'll keep an eye on the time. We, in the interest of time, let me not um, go over the physics as to why the change, the appropriate change. The appropriate measurement of that jiggling is the second derivative, the Laplacian. But it is, that's what's measuring sort of what is the net average change, what's the difference between my temperature and all of my neighbors' temperatures? That's measured by the Laplacian, and that is how the temperature should change in any instant of time. That's the heat equation. Most basic, it's a second order, uh, it's a PDE. Okay, so this is a PDE. They were, they were starting to get the hang of solving these things. Anybody know how to solve this? Okay, good. Then I won't be wasting your time. Um, by the way, it, there's one more rule. If you don't understand something, and you let me keep talking after you don't understand something, you're doing me a disservice, not just yourself. I'm here, I'm not just here to talk out loud. I'm here so that you understand what I'm saying. So if you don't understand, you have to right away, even if you think the other 30 people know everything about what I'm talking about, be arrogant, be um, uh, selfish. I don't care if everybody else gets it. I don't get it. Stop. Tell me what's going on. Okay? That's the rule. If you want to get ahead in mathematics, you cannot let someone say something you don't understand. All right. Um, so we're going to solve this second order PDE. What's the first thing you do when you solve a PDE? You try to, you have two variables, x and t. Separate it. Okay, let's guess, let's guess a solution of the form, some function capital X of little x and some function capital T of little t. I'll try to make my little x's around. Okay, if that's the case, then let's look at this differential equation. Derivative in t doesn't hit the x, it only hits the little t. So now I have big X of little x, t prime of t, and there's no ambiguity now in using primes. On the other side, I have two derivatives in x, which of course is only hitting the capital X. And well, okay, by the way, it doesn't have to be equals, it could be equals with a constant, let's just make that constant one. I don't want to carry on. We're going to have enough constants floating around, we don't need extra constants. All right? So that's it, that's our differential equation. Well, what does this mean? 
What's the point of separating variables? What's your name? Uh, Baoju. Baoju? Uh, you can put x terms. Exactly. Let's, let's bring the x on that side. Let's see, you can still see. I'll do it down here. I'll do it on a new page. We have plenty of paper. We can put the x on one side. So remember what the equation was. Remember what the equation was. I'll put the x on one side, and I'll put the t on the other side. And that it must be a constant. Beautiful. Let's call it c. OK? That's our equation. Remember the initial conditions. The initial, we had two sets of initial conditions. Yep, you can still see them. So the initial condition is that u of x at 0 is f of x. And um, we have this boundary condition that for all time t, we're 0 at the endpoints. We're in a vacuum. That means, since, since we've writ written u as a function of x and t, I don't care what little t is, little x has to be 0 at the endpoints. Okay? So, the, so little, uh, sorry, big x. Big x at the, at the one endpoint and at the other endpoint has to be 0. Wait, why does this equal a constant here? So this is just a function of t. Yeah. And this is just a function of x. Right. So they're not, so as functions of x and t, they're not functions of x and t, they're just constants. Gotcha. This is constant in t, this is constant in x, x and t were the only variables anywhere. So both of these expressions are constant. That's the beauty of separating variables. You get down to ODEs. OK, let's solve this ODE. Uh, let's start with this one. So we have x double prime, I guess minus c x is equal to 0. OK, uh, you guys probably know how to solve this. Even if you don't know how to solve this, you can guess. What's a function that when you differentiate twice, you get a similar function? Yeah, trigs, sines and cosines, or better yet, exponentials. So we're going to guess x of, of little x is equal to e to the, well, I don't know what the relationship will be yet. Let's call this lambda of x. And the point is, if I have two derivatives of this, that's equal to lambda squared, e to the lambda x. And so now we have the equation um, lambda squared e to the lambda x minus some constant e to the lambda x, also known as I can pull out an e to the lambda x, and I'm left with lambda squared minus c is equal to 0. OK? Lambda x e to the something is never 0. So that means that all I need to, to solve this equation is for lambda to be plus or minus uh, square root of c. So that's it. We've solved the equation. There are two solutions, one with a plus sign, one with a minus sign. So the general solution will be some constant, let's call it a, times the solution e to the plus root c x, and some other constant, let's call it b, e to the minus root c x. Pretty simple stuff so far. Okay. Let's put in our initial condition. x of 0 is 0. x of 0 is 0. But x of 0 is just a plus b. OK, so a is negative b. In other words, if I pull out and factor of a, then I'm left with e to the root cx minus e to the minus root cx. What happened there with the b? So b is negative a. Oh, I can't see. Uh, oh. Below. oh, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we have a, we have this general form, but if we put in at the value at 0, a plus b is 0, so b is negative a. So if I put in negative a here, I can pull the a out, and I'm left with a minus sign. So far, so good. OK, let's try the other one. 1 is equal to x of uh, 0 is equal to x of 1. So that's this constant a. And then I have uh, e to the root c minus e to the minus root c. If a is 0, the whole solution is 0. That's stupid. We don't want that. Yeah, so this part must be 0. So if this part's 0, let me multiply by root c. So I must have e to the c is equal to 1. Did I do that right? To 
Yes. Yes. Right? Because it's e to the root c is equal to e to the minus root c. If I multiply by e to the root c. Uh, 2 root c, thank you. Good. Monday morning. Tuesday morning. I don't know what day it is. e to the 2 root c is 1. It doesn't actually matter um, what, what we... The constant is, is what'll, what's important. Okay, so, um, so c equals 0. But if c equals 0, then all of these derivative things are 0, and that's kind of not an interesting... That's not an interesting equation. Right? Then it's just t prime over t is zero, so t is t is constant x x double prime. Right? Not only is it not interesting, it actually can't be the case. Look at this. If the second derivative is zero, that means the first derivative is constant and the function itself is linear, and it's a linear function that has two origins. So it must be the zero function. Okay? So yes, the zero function solves this equation. But we don't want c equals zero, so there's some. There must be some other choice. Yes. Don't you think x and x would be like x We're about to get there, but we're getting there organically by trying to solve this equation. We will. That's we, yeah. The solutions will be trigs and not exponentials, but exponentials are trigs and vice versa. But the ring is complex. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. There are other solutions to this equation, so c can't be zero as we discussed. Or if c equals 0, then an x is 0. So if c can't be 0, well, 2 root c can be 2 pi i times an integer. OK? Does everybody see that? So if that's the case, let's go back here. If that's the case, then our function will be some constant. And then I have an e to the root c. Root c is pi i n. Pi i n x minus e to the minus root c minus pi i n x. And this is nothing but sine. Okay, with some other constant. I'll keep writing a, but it's not the same a. I'm gonna. Not, I'm not even gonna put a prime. Um, so this is just sine of pi n x. Does everybody follow? If you don't understand anything I'm doing, you have to stop. So far, so good. All right. Now let's go back to what c is. C will be the square of this. So c will be, um, I can cancel the twos. C is negative pi squared n squared. So that means we can go back to this equation. Let's go all the way back to this equation. So we've solved x. We know exactly what x is. We know exactly what x is. x of x is some constant times a sine. And that sign is a pi n x for some integer n, n and z. Okay. Um, okay. So t prime. This is the easier equation to solve because it's just um, trivial. It was a constant. The constant was negative pi squared n squared. I don't know if you can still see that or just remember that. I'll just put it here again. The constant was negative pi squared n squared. This is page three. Oh, how's that? Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, you guys know how to, solve, how to solve this. I move that over there. I move it over. So t prime of t plus pi squared n squared t of t is zero. And this one's going to be an exponential. So if t of t is e to the, um, can I use lambda again? Did I use lambda last time? I did, but all right. We got rid of lambda. Let's call it lambda t. Then the derivative is lambda e to the lambda t. And now we know the solution. 
because um, lambda plus pi squared n squared has to be zero, so lambda has to be negative pi squared n squared. So t of t has to be e to the minus pi squared n squared t. And let's just write down what x is. I mean, times a constant, of course. Um, times a constant. And x is some constant. Uh, let me call it a again. And then we had sine of pi n x. Thank you very much. X of x. And that's it. We've solved the heat equation. U of x and t is some constant, let me leave a little room, some constant sine of pi n x e to the minus pi squared n squared t. We're not there yet. We're going to determine these the constant we're going to determine the constant in terms of the initial condition. The little f has not appeared. The fact that uh, we're clamped at 0 at the endpoints has already made its way into the form of x. But we're not at the f yet. That's where all the trouble starts. There was no trouble to this point. Now, this is the solution. A solution. We get a solution for every single integer. So a general solution will just be a superposition, right? We can take any linear combination. Um, n can't be 0. We saw that the constant can't be 0. And the positive and negative values don't do anything here. And here, well, sine is odd. And so we can just pull that into this constant. So we may as well go from 1 to infinity. And now we have a, con we have a constant a in for every integer n. That is now the general solution. Does everybody see that? All right. As, uh, as you said, what's your name? Uh, Justin. Justin? Sumit. Sumit. As Sumit said, what happened to the initial condition? Remember, f of x at 0, u of x at 0 is supposed to be our, our given arbitrary function f of x. Arbitrary still means nice and smooth as far as Fourier was concerned. Um, so how are we supposed to figure out what these coefficients are? Because what we know right now, if I set t equal to 0, this term dies. So I get a sum n at least 1. Ha. I write, I'm writing n at least 1, so I don't need the infinity. n starts at 1 and goes to infinity. Whatever. You, you know how to parse my, my chicken scratch. Um, I have this a n sine of pi n x and nothing because t is 0. So somehow I have to figure out what these ANs are in terms of this function f of x. Fourier knows, Fourier knows <coughs> the orthogonality of sines and cosines. So for example, if we integrate from 0 to 1, sine of pi nx against sine of pi mx dx, these are perfectly nice functions, continuous on a bounded interval. There's no problem with this integral. He knows what the integral is. What is it? Uh, zero unless m and n are equal? Yes. And then 1 if they are? Maybe not 1. Yeah, very close. It's, um, it's a half if they're equal and 0 otherwise. So this, so this is the indicator function of n equals m. So it's 0 unless n equals m, and it's a half otherwise. So what does he do? He says, all right. Let's look at both sides of this and apply this integral. So if I take f of x, I multiply it by sine of pi m x, and I integrate from 0 to 1 dx, what will I get? Well, f of x is this whole thing. So now I have an integral from 0 to 1. f of x is a sum of a n sine of pi n x. and then a sine of m pi x dx. Everybody see that? All right. 
What's that, Justin? Oh, is M fixed in this case? M is fixed, yeah, so fix an M. Yeah. Fix, fix some M. And what we're going to see, so let's reverse orders. <laughs> right? Let's reverse orders. Um, we get this integral, sine of pi nx, sine of pi mx, dx. So the only term that survives is the term when n is equal to m, and the answer gets a factor of a half times a m. He goes, great, I know what the coefficients are. <laughs> so now I, I can write u as a completely explicit function. u, we have completely solved the heat equation. u of xt is equal to a sum as n goes from 1 to infinity. Each of the a n's I can express as, well, twice. So each of the a n's is twice an integral from 0 to 1, f of x sine of pi n x dx times sine of pi n x times e to the minus pi squared n squared t. Thank you very much to the Parisian committee which awarded him a prize for this solution of the heat equation with the dubious citation, we don't think this is right we don't think this is mathematics, this is not rigorous, and this is not general. Has he actually solved the equation, the original equation? Is the value of this concocted thing at t equals 0, does it recover f? He says, sure. Take this thing and do the same thing to it, and you'll see that you know if you, if you undo these integrals in the other order, do this summation in the other order, you'll get f of x. So you've recovered the function. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Just give me the prize. <laughs> all right. Well, while that's happening, so this is, this is the solution. This is what started the whole Fourier series thing. Fourier wasn't trying to make Fourier series. He just wanted to solve the heat equation. He got stuck with this infinite series of trigonometric functions, and people arguing with him that he didn't really solve the problem. Um, the argument really came to a head. I gave you this on the syllabus to read um, with a wonderful theorem of Cauchy. So Cauchy, so here's the theorem of Cauchy. This is also 1821 or something, let's just put 1820s. Um, Cauchy at this time, how many of you be taking complex analysis? Okay. Complex analysis is a gorgeous, beautiful, magnificent subject. It's better than it ever should be in all of the heavens. If you had dreamed up that what complex analysis would be, you wouldn't dream it up as what it is. Every, every integral is zero. Every function is analytic. Like, it's just beautiful. Cauchy single-handedly basically laid the foundations for it. The Cauchy representation, uh, which, which starts, you know, takes up. Um, Cauchy-Riemann equations. Uh, he also was the one that started pestering people about what does what, what do things actually mean? What are we doing here? What is continuity? What do limits mean? In the Cauchy sequences. Um, so, uh, so he knows what a continuous, what it means for a function to be continuous. So let's just put this definition here. Um, a function u, let's say, on the reals, let's keep it simple, is continuous if For all epsilon, for all epsilon, for all x, yeah, it's continuous at x, um, it's continuous at x, let's say, if for all epsilon, small there enough, a there exists a delta, such that if x and x prime are at distance less than delta. Yes, delta. let's just call that if h is less than delta, sure. then, then u of x plus h minus u of x is at most epsilon. Now this formulation is basically what Cauchy was arguing for. Can you can you see? Can I zoom in or something? Is that a little bit better? That's the beauty of this 
technology. Uh, except it won't focus it for some reason. Well, can you still make it out? Yeah. Yeah. So we have u of x plus h minus u of x is less than epsilon. Um, he's thinking about an engineer. He's thinking as an engineer. How much do you want? Uh, if you, if you want the resulting u is some function of like uh, how hard the metal will be or, or what its dimensions will be. How how close do you want me to get to um, the right answer in terms of what the input parameters will be, right? So that's what that's that's where this is coming from. And in fact, he's still at this time talking in words. The closer you get to x, the closer I need to be to x to ensure that when I, when I do the function, I get close enough to the value of the function. Things like this. Bolzano is the one that starts. So Bolzano, Bolzano, like 1817. Um, although for some reason, people don't really pay attention to what he's doing until Weierstrass. So a lot of people will give Weierstrass, this is like 1860s already, um, credit for this kind of precision. But Cauchy is the one that initiated this frame of thought. So the, before this, everyone was talking about limits as these ethereal things, right? If, you're, if you read what Newton actually writes, uh, it's like, you don't take the limit when they're positive, you wait until after they're done being zero. Or something. Like, how do you make sense? You know, we all know what he means, so we just went ahead with it. Didn't bother Euler. But these people are starting to get, um, get antsy about foundations. Um, to the extent that they don't even know what the real numbers are anymore. We get dedicated sums. We'll, we'll do a construction of the real numbers, and then we'll stop doing foundation stuff, because we can spend all semester without getting anywhere if we really focus on foundation. Um, they're very important. Don't, I'm not uh, being derogatory. Um, I'm a little being derogatory. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so Cauchy has this beautiful definition, and his, here's his theorem. If a series of functions converges to another function, and each Sn is continuous, then S is continuous. And then he has a big fight with Fourier. Because Fourier says, what are you talking about? I can take my f to be this. If this is my initial f of x, and I just, you know, if you think about, well, I'm only doing it in 0, 1, so forget about everything else. If I want that to be my f, I'll get that as a sum of sine curves. A sum of sine curves will converge to the sawtooth function. So they have a big fight. And Cauchy says, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm developing rigorous analysis. You're doing this physics nonsense. <laughs> you know, great, you solved the heat equation, but here's why you can't possibly have solved the heat equation. Because I proved this theorem. And I published it in this uh, famous uh, you know, course de analyse, course on analysis. Let's look at his proof. OK, so there's the theorem. Sn is continuous. Um, proof. So what does it mean to be continuous? The each Sn is continuous. That means, um, that, means that given delta, so let's, get, let's be given, a, a, given an epsilon. There exists a delta such that um, Sn of x plus h minus Sn of x is bounded by epsilon for all, for all h bounded by delta. Right? And what does convergence mean? It means that um, given the epsilon, there exists an n sufficiently large so that for all little n greater than n, the distance from Sn of x and S of x is less than epsilon. No argument there. And of course, the same is true at x plus h. Sn of x plus h minus S of x plus h is less than epsilon. So then here's the proof. So then here's the proof. Um, if you look at S of x plus h minus S of x, I can write that as 
s of x plus h minus s sub n of x plus h plus s sub n of x plus h. I just added and subtracted the same thing. Minus s sub n of x plus s sub n of x minus s of x. Yes? Uh, hold your questions. You're, you're, everybody knows that there's something fishy. And there is something fishy. So we're about to see it. Let's just finish the argument. Okay? All you that are groaning are right to be groaning. Can't believe Cushy would do this. Okay? <laughs> now I have the sum of, so everybody agrees with this, right? All I did is add and subtracted the same thing. Okay? So let's put in the less than sign and break up the inequalities. This is at most epsilon, because Sn is approaching S. This is most S, most, at most epsilon, because Sn is continuous. This is at most epsilon, so we get three epsilon. Done. Okay. What's the problem? What's uh, your name? Robert. Robert. So when we chose big N, it depended on X. Yes. And we introduced an H there in the yes. next line, and the same N won't work. Yes. Might not work. The same N might not work. Not only that, we're doing this for every single H in a region. And the supremum, the worst N that you might need in that region, might go to infinity. Yeah. Okay? He has assumed uniform continuity without stating uniform continuity. Okay? So that is one of the reasons. This was a big fight. And people were like, holy crap, we don't know what we're talking about anymore. We, you broke calculus. Good job, Fourier and Cushy. You broke calculus. So now we don't know what we're talking about. Now we really need to settle down and work this out. What's going on? Yes? So do we need to have same epsilon for both continuity and so uniform continuity would say that this condition of continuity, um, this, uh, this condition of continuity is independent of x. doesn't matter where you look. It's not just at every point I have continuity, but that I have uniform continuity. We're going to get to all these things. I don't, I don't expect you to know these things up here. I'm just planting the seeds of why these... We're going to have absolute continuity, uniform, Balzan of art. We, there's going to be so many different things. This is what I mean about complex analysis of beautiful subject. You have one definition, the complex integral, and that's it. You go and you just by yourself will come up with everything. In real analysis, there's like a, it's, it's how everything can go wrong. You want to interchange in a se sequence in a series? Good luck. You want to interchange an integral and have the, the series converge to the integral? Go, you know, again, good luck. Like, no, everything goes wrong. And you have to be very careful, and you have to have these millions of different conditions. And as a student, I found it really uh, boring. Not boring, I found it frustrating. Like, well, this, is, this is not how math should be. So that's why I'm spending this time to talk about why it has to be. Because if you don't do it the proper way, you get stuck with major contradictions. OK? So that's basically um, setting the stage. So. Through the 20s, Cauchy was still kind of uh, arguing with Fourier. Look, I proved this. Uh, see, uh, a sequence of functions converging, a sequence of continuous functions converging to a function must converge to a continuous function. And your series don't, which means you've improperly solved the heat equation. And Fourier says, show me a proof. Show me an error in my proof. And Cauchy says, show me an error in my proof. And eventually, there it is. So, so this is what's wrong. They both had errors. Fourier's error was an error of omission. Well, OK, you could say they both had errors of omission in their proof. Because she omitted the word uniform, because that <laughs> concept didn't exist until people studied what he was doing and said, wait a second, we need to say the word uniform. Fourier didn't have foundations of foundational calculus. He had the, the uh, man on the street definition of an integral and was perfectly happy with it, because everybody before him was perfectly happy with it. No one was arguing. Newton, Leibniz, Euler, Bernoulli, all these people had done amazing things without foundations. Why the hell do we need foundations? For 200 years, we were solving every single you know, amazing equation and made so much progress. Why do you need any of this stuff? You need it. You need it. You're going to do anything rigorous, you need it. Um, all right. So we have a little bit of time. Oh, seven minutes. No. Yeah, that's useless. We go till 40. Good. We have, a, we have a few minutes. Good. Good, good, good. So this is just setting the stage. 
let's talk a little bit about, we're not going to get to uh, actual mathematics probably until next time. Well, maybe we'll see a little bit today. But, um, I mean, this is history, and uh, yeah, we solved the heat equation. All right, we did something today. <laughs> not a bad day. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Riemann integration as opposed to Lebesgue integration. So Riemann, this is like 1854, although it wasn't published until 18, I didn't write it down, 1860s, I think is when, when this actually came out, um, develops the Riemann integral. And everybody knows what I mean by that. Uh, you have some region, you cut up the x-axis, you make little rectangles, and his famous theorem, the theorem, it's a rigorous theorem, it's a beautiful theorem, the Riemann integral theorem is if f is continuous, on a to b, then the Riemann integral exists. Okay, and the proof is very simple. You just write down what the Riemann integral is. You have a lower and an upper estimate for everything. And point-wise, all of those are converging. So that's it. If you, so I won't do it rigorously, uh, but uh, exercise. Not to be handed in. Some exercises I will ask you to hand in, uh, additional. This this is one. Just for, for your own edification, make sure that you can prove this. Prove this rigorously. Okay? You know the definition. It's limit as the as the mesh of the partition goes to zero. Should I write this down? Let me write it down. What is this real? It's the limit as the mesh. Uh, you guys know what the mesh of a partition is? So I have A to B. I'm going to chop it up into little xi, xi to xn, and the, well, there's a variety of ways of doing it. So, so you take your xi to xn that are at most A and B, and um, so that's a partition. That's a partition. And um, the mesh of a partition is the largest, is the max of xj plus 1 minus xj. I don't need absolute values because they're increasing. Okay, what's the largest? It doesn't have to be perfect, evenly spaced rectangles, whatever you want. Take the mesh, and then the limit as the mesh goes to zero of uh, what we're really trying to prove is that the upper Riemann integral uh, exercise. Write all of this out. <laughs> it's, it takes a second. It's not that in, uh, enlightening. You want me to do it? Oh, I'll do it. A sum over i goes from 1 to n, this is our partition, um, of f, uh, the lower bound on this interval, let's call this interval i, interval i is, uh, interval i is xi to xj, xi plus 1 rather, um, times the length of the interval. Okay, so it's the length of the, the largest interval that's going to 0, that's the um, lower Riemann sum minus the same thing, but now with the upper Riemann sum, which is the largest value f attains in this interval, this thing goes to zero. The, the limit is zero. Okay, so the Riemann integral is indeed well defined, and it's either of these. Okay, that's the theorem. And it's very simple, it's because the function. Locally, it's continuous, so locally, it's, it's small. So it's not that we have these discontinuous functions that are 0 on the rationals and 1 on the irrationals that we're like, oh, crap, Riemann integration doesn't work. It's because of fundamental issues like the solution to the heat equation that forces the Fourier series, that forces all the... Uh, some of you, by the way, laughed at a, at a good place also, uh, which is when we reversed orders here. We reversed orders of summation and integration. How did we do that? We have all these uh, constants we don't know anything about. We have a wildly oscillating series, and we're going to reverse orders and then and then pull the integral. Right? We have a sum of infinitely many functions in an integral, and we're going to interchange those. There's no just so that's what those of you that said Fourier was wrong. This is what need, needed justifying, um, and it's not right and you have exercises for examples of functions for which this isn't right. Um, okay, so Riemann integration is not sufficient to deal with those issues. Uh, Lebesgue integration, 
So Lebeg says, don't break up the x-axis into pieces. You have some function you want to integrate. You want to find the area from here to here. You break up the y-axis. That's it. That's the only difference. So you break up the y-axis, except now you don't get rectangles. You get some regions. Like, this is the region where, where f has this y plus delta y value. OK? So the problem isn't evaluating f. F is easy. The problem is evaluating the measure of the intervals. Haha, <laughs> if only they were just intervals. The measure of, uh, so, so you need measure theory. So, that, so Lebesgue, uh, the idea is break y axis, not x, but then you need measure theory. Now, Fortunately, Lebesgue's thesis advisor was Emile Borel, who had just invented the beginnings of Borel measure. And Borel measure is not quite what you need. You need something slightly more general. They differ on sets of measure zero. You need Lebesgue measure. So Lebesgue's thesis defines Lebesgue measure and uh, defines Lebesgue integration. Okay, uh, it's good to have a good thesis advisor. Um, so you need measure theory. Now, this is 1902. Borel's uh, uh, theory of measure is just a few years before that. So Lebesgue was hot on, on uh, the trail, came around at the right time, and Borel was generous with his thesis problem. Um, so I don't know. They understood that there was something um, that really needed to be developed with measure theory. But uh, by the time Vitali. So these are Vitali sets. But by the time Vitali comes up with Vitali sets, people know that the foundational things are going on. So let's talk about Vitali sets for a second. So these are, uh, let, let's talk about what that is. So problems with issues with measure theory. Issues with, why don't you just measure the length of the interval? I know, I know what that is. If you have an interval A to B, the length is B minus A. Done. Why is, why is the big integration hard? What's the problem? Here's the problem. Issues with measure theory. All right. Um, we have the real numbers. We still haven't talked about what the real numbers are, by the way, but we'll, we will. Um, intuitively, you know what the real numbers are, and that'll be enough for, for now. And it'll also be enough once we're done talking about uh, foundational ways of constructing re the real numbers. We won't ever use them again. We'll go back to your intuitive way. Because if you really want to do it, and people have, it takes about 500 pages to get to like one is less than two. Okay, well maybe not one and two because they're natural numbers, but uh, as real numbers, one is a real number, it's an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences or whatever. Um, all right, so so here's the real numbers. If I take the R mod Z, let's look at what R mod Z means. This means it's the real numbers mod out by two real numbers x and y will be called the same x is the same as, f, as y if they differ, if their difference is an integer, is in z. Yes, Justin? It's a circle. It's a circle. It's a very simple set. It's easy to come up with a set of coset representatives. Um, we can take 0 to 1, let's say open at 1 and close at 0, and that is a perfectly fine Circle, it's, it's just the real numbers, but now you've wound them up, and you're looking down from above, and what you see is a circle. Okay, everybody, everybody has that picture. There's nothing, no funny business here. All right, that's not the problem. Let's look at R mod Q. Okay, so in other words, we'll, we'll again have R mod some equivalence relation. The equivalence relation is that two real numbers are the same, if and only if their difference is a rational number. Now we can make a choice, so let's call this set n. And I can make a choice, so for every real number, I have root 2. Well, there's root 2 minus a half, and root 2 plus 5 twelfths, and root 2 minus uh, a million and 4. Root 2 plus or minus any rational number is in the same equivalence class as root 2 itself. 
So I can always choose, can choose representatives for n such that, uh, with the representative being in uh, 0, 1. And I can even do it open, half open, like that. Right? Because I can shift by integers. I can, I can shift not only by, re by rational numbers, I can shift by integers, so I can certainly get it into 0, 1. Right? That's a perfectly fine set. Um, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yes, very good. Uh, so, so we choose these representatives. And now what? What's the problem? Well, what do we want measure theory to do? Let's say, so let's say M of a set E, which is a subset of the reals, uh, is our measure, is our measure function. Measure function. Okay. Uh, is that better? So, so I'll say that M is my measure function. So I have a subset of the reals. I want to, I want to, I want to send subset of the reals to positive real numbers, not negative real numbers. Okay. Um, what do I? What properties do I want? It better be translation invariant, right? Um, if I take the set E and I translate it all by some real number H, that had better be the same. So this is translation invariant. We don't want one to two to, to have more measure than two to three. In the real numbers, there are other uh, places where you can harm measure or something else. Um, we want translation invariance. How about disjoint sets? Yeah, the measure of a bunch of disjoint sets, let's say E, well, a union, a disjoint union of, of sets EI. So this is disjoint. That should not be anything other than the sum of the measures. Right, that makes sense. Um, how about the measure of zero to one? Probably be one. Should probably be one. That would not be a good measure theory if the measure of zero to one was not one. All right. And um, and you can't have these. Do you want non-negative? Should be non-negative. Sure. M M of E is not negative. Yep. Do you want only countable constraint unions or? Do you want your assumption to be? Uh, it could arbitrary. be arbitrary. I've written countable, even countable. You can't have. So the measure should be could be infinite. The measure could be infinite. The measure of their whole real line is infinite. Yeah, it could be infinite. It's in the extended real numbers. Yes, or infinite. Yeah. So these are the things that you would like to have, and I claim you can't have them. So let's prove, let's, let's show you why, what, why there's something to be done, why we're here. What we're going to be doing all semester long is working out all of these details. Okay? So Vitaly's example of a set which you can't make sense of is the following. Um, so what is the measure of this set? So we have this n, right? n sits inside 0, 1. So here's 0, here's 1, and I have a bunch of points. It's totally discontinuous. It's it's some. Um, these are all representatives. For every real, real number, I'll choose a representative that lies in zero. One. Fine. Um, I don't know what the measure is, but let's look at uh, n plus a rational number. Well, let's. So I claim that this is disjoint. For r not equal to 4, r in q not equal to 0, this is disjoint from the original. Wait, what do you, what do you mean by like n plus r again? What I mean, mean take every element of n and shift it by the same fixed number r. Well, I thought n was like a set of cosets or something. Well, I've chosen, I've chosen a set of representatives. Okay. okay. So I shouldn't write it at, uh, as a quotient, really, because this means this means the, the full cosets. Right. What I mean is choose a representative for each. Okay. okay. So this is my n sitting inside 0, 1. So do we always assume that we have the axiom of choice? 
Hang on. You guys are all, you're all there. You're all there. Yeah. Hang on. Okay, so we've chosen this set of representatives. Of course, I'm getting to the axiom of choice. That's the, that's, uh, which Zermelo had just a few years before Vitali uh, formalized for discussing the well-ordering principle. We're getting there. So not everyone knows that, so that's why I want to surprise those that don't. Okay, here's the problem. So, so if I take this, these representatives, I shift everybody by the rational number r, that's disjoint from the original set. Everybody agrees with that. Okay. Why? So if, because if n is, so if I have a number, let's call it x, and that x represents the coset of all the r shifts. So I've chosen x and not x plus r, which means x plus r is not in n. And that's true for any x in n. So n plus r for any rational number. As representatives. As representatives. We have got to, in order for this to work, we have got to first fix a set of representatives. Which is the axiom of choice, which is using the axiom of choice, which is what's wrong with what's, what's about to happen. Um, okay? So these are all disjoint. For every single distinct rash, uh, rational number, these are all disjoint. But if I take the, u the disjoint union over all the rational numbers, say between 0 and 1, I can't see. So if I take the countable union, even countable, the, re the rational numbers are countable. Uh, do we know about countability? How far back should we go? Uh, be honest, if you haven't uh, seen the countability of the rationals. OK, so a couple of people haven't. We're going to come back to that. I have to, I have to prove to you that the rationals are, are countable. Um, so the disjoint union of all of these sets, n plus r. Uh, let's make it from, yeah, let's, let's go from minus 1 to 1. Okay, just to make our life our life simple. So when r is equal to zero, we get the original set of rep coset representatives. For all the other values, well, we shift by some positive and negative amounts. This set is a subset of well, n the smallest n gets is zero, and r gets as small as negative one. So we're not going to get below negative one. The, the largest n gets is one. R doesn't get bigger than one, so we're in one to two. So there's no problem with this. This is this some compact region. I claim that this set also contains the entire 0, 1. Does everybody see that? We've taken a representative, a coset representative, for that point x. Um, we've shifted it by all possible rational numbers in the unit interval, forward and backward. So you give me any. Uh, any real number whatsoever, it has some representative in the set n, which is a shift by a rational number less than 1 in absolute value from that representative. So the entire interval 0, 1 is contained in here. Okay, so the measure of this set, the measure of this set, it's at most 3, it's at least 1, And these sets are all disjoint, so it is an infinite sum, it's a sum over all the rational numbers from minus 1 to 1 of the measure of n plus r. That's using countable disjoint additivity. Should be translation invariant. Should be able to take the value of minus one and one. If you like, sure. Why not? Why? If you, you if you have zero as your representative for the rationals, then I, I don't care about endpoints right now. We're gonna deal with boundary. Boundary will be a key issue, but not not right now. Um so I take infinitely many sums of this number, and it's got to be between 1 and 3. So what is the measure of n? Can't be 0. 
you add zero infinitely many times, you don't get something bigger than one. Okay, so um, so what's the upshot? There is no way to assign measure to n. The set n, the set n, is not measurable. There must be sets that are not measurable. Now, many of you brought up this point, which until someone points it out to you is not at all obvious that there's something wrong with this argument also. It's that we made this choice of coset representatives. Why can we, why can we choose coset representatives? Well, the fact that we can or, or can't is called the axiom of choice. The axiom of choice, so the axiom of choice, can't see. Can't see. The axiom of choice, which was formalized by Zermelo, 1904-ish, just before Vitali, just before the construction of this non-measurable set, this axiom of choice says, yes, you can. So if you will allow me the axiom of choice, which I need for all kinds of other things, then there have to be non-measurable sets. And then you get into things like the Bonaftarsky paradox, where you take a ball, you chop it up in a precise way, and you, let's say, into five pieces, and you put those five pieces back together, and you get two balls of the same size, using nothing but translation and rotation. You have not stretched. There's no stretching involved. It's literally rigid motions, rigid Euclidean motions, chopping up a ball into two balls of equal size. If that seems counterintuitive, if, that, if it seems like you shouldn't be able to do that, well, then you shouldn't be able to do this either. On the other hand, how could the axiom choice not be true? So to, um, there's a long story. Yeah, it's good that I'm running out of time, because this, this story would really take us uh, a ways out of the way. So what people eventually settled on, people were happy with zermelo frankel axioms, Frankel axioms of set theory, Obviously, set theory gets involved. Uh, and one of Hilbert's problems is to work out what's, what's going on here. Um, and uh, eventually, Paul Cohen. So this is uh, Gödel, Gödel plus Paul Cohen show that the axiom of choice is independent of the zermelo frankel axioms of set theory. So it's up to you if you want to do measure theory with the axiom of choice or if you want to do measure theory without the axiom of choice. If you do measure theory without the axiom of choice, um, there are no non-measurable sets. Uh, but there's all kinds of other stuff that you can't do. I mean, is that true there, that you need the axiom of choice to construct a non-measurable set? Um, let me see. I, I believe that is true, but let me give it as a homework to chase that question down. Because <laughs> off the top of my head, I don't know of a reference. Okay. Um, certainly, any non-measurable. Yeah, I think that is. I think that is actually true. You don't need but full I don't. Power. You don't need full power of choice. You don't need weak choice. Sorry again. You don't need weak choice. You need a weak form of that. A weak form of choice. Yeah. yeah. What's the weak form? I'm not too sure, but like well, I don't know how much you don't need. Yeah. There, there are much weak. So, like like I said, this stuff is going to get us very quickly into deep thorny issues that we can chase forever and never get to measure theory. So, uh, well, in fact, wh when I was a first year grad student and I was sitting in on a course on linear algebra or something, I forget what, and the professor said, all right, so by Zorn's level, you do this, and sort of raised my hand and said, so uh, professor, sorry, we're gonna use the axiom of choice. And, and he said, uh, maybe where you come from, that's something you argue with. But the, for the rest of us, yes, we just use choice and we don't even bother saying it. So. Um, I feel where you guys are coming from, and yes, we're just going to use choice. We've talked about it. It's it's a it's a choice that we've made to use <laughs> choice. Uh, we have to. We're we're gonna we're gonna do everything with choice. Um, so let me. Uh, uh, I don't have time to construct real numbers. I was going to construct real numbers. It Five takes in, in two minutes. Uh, it it doesn't take much. It's just the cut. It's a. I'll just say it's the Cauchy equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences is one way of constructing choice. We're going to talk a little bit more about those subtle -ish things, maybe just five minutes next time, and then we'll get into beginning of measure theory, exterior measure, 
uh, start dealing with uh, these issues. And um, we'll touch, so this book doesn't right away jump into metric spaces, so maybe I'll, uh, maybe I will, because Fallen does, and we need to know it. Um, and it's not so different working with general metric spaces as working with the real numbers themselves. So uh, we'll see how that goes, but I think that'll be it for today. <laughs>